Heroes are an inspiring group of people, every one of them from the larger-than-life comic book heroes you see on the big silver screen to the everyday heroes that let us live the privileged lives we do. Every hero has a story to tell. The doctor saving lives at your local hospital, the war veteran down the street who risked his lives for our freedom, the police officers and firefighters who risk their safety to ensure ours. Every hero is special and every story worth telling, but there is one class of heroes that I think is often ignored. The entrepreneur, the creator, the producer, the ones who look at the problems in this world and think to themselves, you know what? I can fix that. I can help people. And I can make a difference. Then they go out and do exactly that by creating a new product or introducing a new service. Some go on to change the world. Others make a world of difference to their customers. Welcome to The Hero Show. Join us as we pull back the masks of the world's finest heropreneurs and learn the secrets to their powers, their success, and their influence. So you can use those secrets to attract more sales, make more money, and experience more freedom in your business. I'm your host, Richard Matthews, and we are on in three, two, one. Hello, and welcome back to The Hero Show. Richard Matthews here. I am live on the line with Ginger. Ginger, are you there? Hello. Yes. Awesome. Glad to have you here. And um, I am, of course, you know, for those of you who are regular watchers of the show, you know, we travel full time. And today, our, our scenery here, we're sitting atop um, a, a parking garage over Santa Barbara. Um, so, uh, you know, always new different places where we host these episodes from. Um, let me do a quick introduction for Ginger. Ginger, um, so I've looked at my notes here for you guys. Here's where I'm looking. Um, is a connector, speaker, trainer, and coach. And she says she's going to energetically share her message and mission of connectivity, the human to human kind, not the fiber optic kind, which I think is great. Um, so let's start off same way I start off all these shows, Ginger. Tell us what it is that people come to you for now. What's your business about? Why do people come to you? Wow. That's such a great question, Richard. Um, why do people come to me as a connector? I am fascinated with how we get to know each other, how we meet, how we are introduced, how we rub shoulders. And so people come to me because the why and the how to are the fundamentals of connectivity. So the human to human kind, that interaction, that personal um, engagement is so critical. And it's so fascinating, Richard. As a traveler, you know this to be true, right? Absolutely, yeah. It's, it's, it's just so interesting. And if we let ourselves be open to it, everything is possible. So people come to me because I teach the why and the how to, the tactics of actually, how do I meet another person? What do I do about that? I don't want to network. That feels icky or whatever. But they want to really have meaningful relationships. So that's why people come to me. The speaking, the training, and the coaches, uh, coaching is our modalities, if you will, of how I bring connectivity to the world. Yeah, I really like that too, because connection is like, I tell people all the time that we're a story born people, right? That we connect to each other with our stories. Um, and one of the things I tell my kids all the time is that you, the way that you tell the difference between an acquaintance and a friend and a best friend is how much of their story you know, right? So like an acquaintance is someone whose name you might know, but whose story you don't. And like yeah. a friend might be someone who's, you know, you know a little bit of their story and a best friend might be someone who you shared all of your stories together. And the only way to get to know each other better is to go out and create new stories together. Right? <laughs> That's um, a great definition. I like that. Yeah. So, so that connection, you actually teach people the skills to go and do that. Um, and like you, you mentioned, uh, one of the things that like, we travel all the time, right? So we're constantly on the road and we, we move every two to three weeks, which means we're in new places. And if we want to have friends or have connection when they're in those places, we realize that we have, to, we have to do it quick and we have to do it now because it might not be there tomorrow, right? right. A lot of the people that are with us are, are transient as well or the people we meet at, at restaurants or at the beach or whatever. So we make quick friends and you know, have people over for dinner and stuff like that all the time. And it's, it's a, I don't know, it's a compressed, skill you learn when you're traveling but it's not something that everyone has the opportunity to just practice all the time like we do so it's cool that that's a it's something that you actually help people with i i do and i would uh parry back and say it's something that everybody has the opportunity to do because if you zoom out richard like your kids if they saw you only connecting with people when you felt like you quote had a lot of time that wouldn't be real life that wouldn't help you so sometimes we have to kind of create this urgency of look we don't know how long this ride is we don't know how long it is we don't know how short it is we don't know if i'm going to see you again we don't know if i'm not going to see you again so connectivity to me has this 
amazingly wonderful sense of urgency to it. Like if I don't connect with you today, then when am I going to do it? What's more important than human to human connection? Nothing. Because without it, yeah. we don't do anything. We're not inspired. We're not, we're not thrust into the opportunities or we don't create the opportunities. Because I think, okay, I'm going to go hang out with my friend Richard. Well, what does that mean? That means everything that like you just divine that we've shared together, that we want to share together, that we want to create. So if we have this sense of urgency about really creating and developing those friendships, relationships that we want, oh man, life is so much richer. And if you want to talk speed, it absolutely speeds that up, but it doesn't speed up life. It just enriches it. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I, I like that thought too about it being urgent all the time because the, the, one of the things I, I was talking to my business partner the other day about this, that uh, traveling didn't make us have a sense of urgency. It made us realize a sense of urgency that was already there. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, and and that's, that's sort of what, where, where the differentiator is, is like now you're aware of it because you have, you have a feedback loop. Right. all the time showing you that the people are leaving and they're in and out of your life um, very quickly. So you have a positive feedback loop that's showing you that urgency. And in everyday life, when you're not doing something as crazy as we are, right, you don't have that type of a positive feedback loop showing it to you. So you're not always seeing the urgency. Um, so, yeah, that's an interesting thought. And, and we can, if we get into that mindset, because you know, this, the, you know, like, part of the idea of hero to me, because it's the hero podcast is being your own hero first and looking around at your relationships, both the ones that you have, as well as the ones you want to create and taking a look at those and thinking, how much am I investing in those relationships? Because that should be kind of a, an importance meter, a thermometer of how much do those people matter? Now, to be really clear, this doesn't mean that one person is worth more than another. What it means is that how connected you feel to somebody is a meter for how much time and effort and energy and investment of yourself you put into them. How much do you help them? How, how willing are you to go get them at 3 a.m. at the airport? And, and how willing are they to retrieve you? So it's a really interesting thing to think about. In fact, I think we take so many of our connections for granted, Richard. It's in some of my coaching I've taken the last couple of years, one of them in particular, um, who I, I follow and I, I'm in their mastermind, Brennan Bouchard, he says, you know, look, you have three different kinds of friends. So along your acquaintances, good friend, you know, friends and best friends, closest friends, there are real ripples out. And sometimes that's hard and uncomfortable for us to look at that saying, well, that third ripple, they're not as quote important. Well, that's not what we're saying here. What we're saying here is, who do you want to go deep with? Who do you want to build a bridge with a relationship with where there's mutual enjoyment and, and benefit and support and so forth. So rethinking our relationships in general is something that many of us are loath to do because it feels judgmental. Yeah. Um, at the same time, it can be incredibly clarifying and liberating, quite frankly. Yeah, that's, that's a, very very true and you have to really think about your your relationships and which ones you want to put the time and effort into because if you don't put time and effort to them you're not going to get anywhere with them so my my next question for you is how did you get into this space right how did you get into being a a connector um and someone who speaks and coaches on that like what what's what was the entrepreneurial journey how did you go from you know just a normal everyday lady to someone who is <laughs> doing this professionally there's the, that one I'm correct. I'm not a normal everyday anything, but thanks. <laughs> um, probably like a lot of your fabulous audience, which I've done a variety of things. And um, middle school teacher, firefighter, bread maker, um, hardware, all kinds of things. So how did I get into the connectivity? I'm a really fun middle school teacher. Oh, I love middle school. They're my people. I completely understand them. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, so uh, how did I get into this space? That's a great question. I appreciate that question. So if you can imagine a field of prairie dogs, pull it up in your mind. Someone's popping their heads up out of the- Yeah, exactly, the right, right. Their burrow is underground. That's where they sleep and they rest and so forth. And they pop up when they're ready to do something. So they pop up and they wee, and they make all kinds of sound or whatever they do, prairie dogs are good at. And about two years ago, I found myself at kind of a, it wasn't kind of, it was a juncture. I was restless and frustrated with what I was doing. And I thought it's up to me to change it. 
So let's change. I am not afraid of change. I know it's coming anyway, so I'm embracing it. So I hit this field of prairie dogs because I'm leaving something behind. I don't know what's ahead and I start paying attention and I would pop up out of the ground, so to speak, I'm like, oh, I'm gonna do this thing. Yeah, that's the thing. And I'd be all excited and all whipped up. And, then, and eventually I'd go back down underground because I just didn't have all the, like, yeah, I wasn't, I wasn't quite there. It wasn't, no, I don't, okay. All right. And I'd pop back up again. And you know, you can imagine this, imagine this three or four times. Well, finally, probably about the fifth or sixth time, I stopped counting, I popped up and I'm like, oh my gosh, it's connectivity. And it's always been connectivity. And that totally lit my, my brain on fire because connectivity you is- what makes you come alive. Yeah, it totally, I, I'm naturally a high energy person, but it really excites me, Richard, because it's when we know how to connect on purpose, with a purpose, with the idea of serving somebody else, man, that changes everything. And if you look at people making a difference in this world, anybody, no matter what their formal position is, or what they quote do, what they don't do, yeah. they are truly connected. They're truly plugged into what they're doing and why they're doing it. Their why, their purpose, their vision. I'd ask you, you know, why have you traveled so much? You could give me a, a fantastic answer because it's all these things to you. You're really connected to that. Connectivity to me is this, this super highway of opportunity. And while we have our own lane forward of this is, this is where I wanna go and this is where I'm driving, there's all these other lanes that we can explore and move into and move out of. Like a, a pro bicycler said, sometimes we're converging and sometimes we're diverging. And that's what I love about connectivity because in the end we converge together, yet we can diverge and explore and keep coming back and forth and so forth. So the connectivity, while it's a word that's common or at least pretty well known, not a lot of people have an understanding of what it means to them. My yeah. mission my mission is to connect the world and help people look at their why. Why are they doing what they're doing? Why are they living the life they're living? And then how do you connect to the people on purpose with a service mindset, meaning you want to take care of other people in some way that gets me out of bed, keeps me up at night, does all those things. So connectivity is really powerful. There's not a lot of people talking about it, how I'm talking about it. And so I know I have a lot of work to do and that's okay <laughs> because I see how this, I see how this, I have experienced how this, I see other people using what I've given them and what they're learning and what they want to know. I see how it changes lives and that's, that's pretty darn potent. So I have two questions for you um, based on sort of a bunch of those things. First one okay. is how much do you think your previous, uh, what do you call them, experiences, being a middle school teacher, bread maker, those kind of things, influenced your desire to really get into and understand connectivity? And the second question is, who is your, who's your client? Who, who do you end up working with the most often? Are they, you know, other people who have, you know, have jobs or are they business professionals or are they other speakers, consultants, like, you know, professional business people? What, who's your target market? So two questions for you on that. Sure. Do you want me to go in a specific order? Yeah, just pick either one. Whichever okay. one suits your fancy. Okay. Um, so the first one, how did I... How did I, how do those other experiences inform where I'm at with connectivity? Yeah, what you're doing now with connectivity. Like middle school students, for, for instance, um, are most of us, most of the normal people think that middle school students are, <laughs> are um, to put it nicely, the worst. <laughs> yes. And, um, and, right. and you can talk with them, obviously. Um, so like that, that experience, how does that inform what you're doing now? And like, you know, some of the other things that you, you mentioned. Sure, that was a great question. Um, I didn't set out to teach middle school and I, um, I subbed, I, were, I was in a really tiny district and I just wanted to teach, I just wanted to do the thing. And so I subbed and I, I got a, a middle school position after a couple of years of subbing and I just fell in love with them. And, and what I love about that age, which by the way, nobody does want to go back to, nobody raised their hand like, yeah, I want to go back to middle school. I mean, we'd rather go back to high school or something else. <laughs> or get root canals. But um, the thing I love about middle <laughs> school and what, how it informs where I'm at now is that middle schoolers are super open. Now, some people are gonna push back on that. They can push back all they want. I'm gonna go forward. Middle schoolers, when given the chance, like anybody, if they are given the trust and the opportunity to be themselves, to figure out what they're about, and to have somebody support them in that, 
that's true connection. I had, here's, here's a perfect story. So every year I had new classes, of course, but I was in the same middle school and I saw some of the kids years, year over year. I never had a discipline problem, Richard. And here's why. Every brand new class who came into the room every year, regardless if I know them or not, I started with the same opening. I said, you know, welcome, welcome to art. I taught art, so it was double crazy. It was great. Um, and I said, I'm going to treat you how you treat me. You get a clean slate when you walk through these doors. There's, there's, I'm not judging you. I don't care who your siblings are. I don't care what family you came from. I'm going to give you a fresh start. And so I'm going to treat you this way. If you treat me this way, it's going to be awesome. So I never had a discipline problem because some people and middle schoolers are a prime example. They, we label people and they bring that label with them. Unfortunately, they don't, they don't want that label, but we leave that label on them with like sticky glue. And if we, if we get rid of seeing people with a label, with a definer, then everything's possible because all of a sudden that pressure from that label falls away. Whether it's the smart kid or the smart kid's sibling or the rowdy kid or the band geek or the jock. I mean, we pick whatever definer you want. I really connected with them, Richard, because they just so desperately wanted to be themselves. And I realized that we all need that. So that's been a huge informer forward for me of like, look, just, just drop the gloves, just let it unfold and have a great time. And I, my, my principal, I, I was so lucky I had a great principal who supported me. So that was another really strong connection. That's been a huge informer um, of giving people a fair shake. Uh, and, and so that's been hugely informational. My hardware experience, people want to build a life they love. They want to be in a space they love. So hanging a picture on the wall, it's not just an aesthetic thing. It's a, wow, I can see a picture of my family thing. Or the toilet's working, so I don't have to worry about that. I mean, these things that we don't think about, to me, have an element of connectivity to them. So that's all of those experiences absolutely informed. The 10 years of research I did on women in beer, that's a whole other conversation for another day, but that absolutely informs me because people want to be heard. Until we ask somebody a question that they have a story or an opinion on, um, they're, they're silent and silent isn't agreement. Silence isn't always a good thing. So to give people the opportunity to connect was one of my biggest takeaways from, from doing the women and, and beer work. So that's the first awesome. question. So that, you, you have a, a, a lot of stuff in there and I, you know, I tease that nobody wants to, uh, nobody wants to work with middle schoolers. And that's just because, you know, the, uh, that's, that's the age where they all start puberty and go crazy. Um, so, so good on you for, uh, for working with them in that, that time period. I know I've got four kids that are going to go through here in the next, uh, well, let me know if I can help support you. <laughs> we, I think we need to remember in that, and, and I know it's true, you know, you are going crazy, your body's changing, you can't do anything about that. So what you do is you learn to roll with it. You learn to figure out how to move forward because you're moving forward anyway. So just figure the stuff out and have a good sense of humor. Humor is enormously important. Um, and, and just keep connecting with what really matters to you and like let the rest of the junk go. Yeah. And it's such a strange time too, because everyone's expecting you to be grown up, but you're not quite grown up yet. And like, you know, it's just, it's just a hard period. So, you know, being a teacher in that space, I remember my middle school teachers are some of the best. I, I, I remember them really clearly because they, you know, they had a lot of impact on your life. So it's a, yes. an important thing. Yes. <laughs> if you give them the benefit of trusting, um, they will do anything for you. That, that was a sweet spot I found too, Richard. They, they were still open for the right person. They were still open for the person they trusted. And so if you gave them that trust, if you gave them that safe space, um, they, they would do anything for you. And they're smart. They're smart. Holy buckets. Are, you don't, I don't have to tell you this. Yeah. They're so smart. And people think they're stupid. That makes me crazy. That's so unfair. That's like older people. They're not deaf and they're not stupid just because they're old. We're all going to be there. So let's take a look forward at that crystal ball. <laughs> yeah, that's one of the things that I've, I've um, loved about traveling is uh, um, we have a lot of opportunity to meet with, you know, people a generation or two ahead of us. Yes. Uh, because the traveling market is full of them. Yes. Um, and there's just so much you can learn in stories and other things, um, you know, from people who are uh, just far further in life than I am. Right. Um, which is cool. So we always, we always try to, you know, set aside time to, 
meet and have lunch or have dinner or, you know, spend the evening talking with people, um, you know, to your point, making connections. For sure. So my, why, why do you suppose so many older people travel? Because, uh, so I've, I've discovered there's two groups of people um, that travel. Um, so there's the uh, group of people who are, are traveling um, because they've reached retirement, they're looking just to have, um, you know, like freedom. And, you know, they worked their whole lives to get there, so they're doing it. Um, and uh, um, they're looking for, you know, connections and friends and other people who are doing the same things as them. Mm -hmm. um, and then the second group of people I've just, I've labeled the crazies. Um, and the, they're, they're the ones that have connection problems, I would assume, assume. Mm -hmm. um, you know, since that's the topic, because they, uh, you know, they don't have kids or grandkids or anything like that and they're not particularly nice so I don't know why they travel um, <laughs> be interesting but, to have some of those conversations wouldn't it yeah yeah so yeah. we've we've run into uh we've run into a, a number of people on both sides of that and it's it's what's funny is you'll find the uh some of the older generation who are grandparents will totally uh defend you and defend your children and their right to play and have a good time from the uh um, the crotchety old folks who uh, don't want you to be around. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's good. You know, I think the core of, of whatever group you're part of, so to speak, or whatever you identify, is that you're connected to something. And, mm -hmm. and it's your choice. And, you know, whether you want to be connected to silence in the middle of the Nevada desert or connected with 50 family members, doesn't matter. Uh, we just, we all want to feel like that worth, that purpose, that vision, that connectivity is ours to claim and and it's it's pretty precious so it's a it's an interesting world out there and and we have all kinds of people in it whether it takes them all or not i don't know but we've got them <laughs> so other question is who who hires you yes that's a great question thank you three magic words <laughs> yeah <laughs> um who hires me people uh who hire me are the ones who are looking for um a few things so uh, for example, in three weeks, I will be speaking uh, at a community college conference. Super excited to do that. And they're bringing me in because they want a little jolt to the inspiration. Now, I don't call myself a motivational speaker, Richard. In the end, people are gonna call me what they're gonna call me, that's fine. But they recognize that connectivity is a huge part of inspiration, and here's what I mean. They um, are in the trenches every day. They meet new students, they meet administrators, faculty, each other, all these things, and they are the front line for that college. These are the people who are in the registrar's office and so forth, and they're seeing lots and lots of people, dozens if not hundreds of people every day. How do you stay inspired? How do you feel like you are connecting with all of them when sometimes it is just one person right after the other? And fundamentally, what's most important here is how do you stay connected to yourself? How do you, how do you keep yourself inspired? So the people who bring me in like that case, they see that there's something to this connectivity stuff. And frankly, a lot of people can't define it and that's okay. I can help them. Mm -hmm. I help them take a look. What does it mean to be connected? I generally don't start with the why for most people. Some people see that and want it right away to learn your purpose and your own vision. Your why is what I call it to know what drives you forward. Why are these professionals in the community college space? You know, they could be anywhere. They're smart people. They're capable. They're choosing this on purpose. So people will bring me in, have a specific purpose on wanting to know more about connectivity. Skills is a huge part of it. I teach tactics. So the how-to, the roadmap, as it were, for a traveler like yourself is really important. Because if you don't know where you're yeah. going, you're just gonna wander. And wandering's okay, but wandering is still wandering. And if you want some focus, if you want some specificity to strategy and tactics of how to connect with people, starting with why you're there in the first place, I absolutely do that. Workshops, um, recently doing one with a, a paramilitary organization here in town and, and that uh, paramilitary is like fire police, those kinds of great people who help keep us safe. And they wanted to add some, some um, interpersonal skills with their technical skills. Great idea because we can, we can throw hose, we can run the fire trucks, we can get in the cop car, whatever it is all day long. But unless we can communicate with each other interpersonally, then we're going to run into some, some serious challenges. So interpersonal skills is another one that people see there's connectivity to. And that's absolutely true. So when it boils down to it, I've got a framework 
uh, the seven elements of connectivity. And people can plug themselves into that framework where they fit. This is not a one size fits all, it never does. But it's like building a house. You've got to have a structure to build from there. So that framework is what all my work is based on. And depending on who is coming to me for help, we look at what piece of that framework they want. Um, the uh, local library is hiring me uh, in a few months to come in and talk about the customer experience. So people who are very customer facing, real estate agents, retailers, um, MLMs, people who have a direct sales focus, yeah. They will come and ask for the skills again, the interpersonal, how do I meet somebody? How do I quote network? I mean, connecting isn't networking. We'll talk about that another time, but, but how to develop those relationships because their business relies on it. Yeah, so you have, you have a, a wide swath of people that reach out and, uh, and do those kind of things, uh, which, is, which is really interesting. So basically anyone, uh, well, you know, I say anyone, but the reality is that probably everyone who has some sort of, you know, do you connect with other people in your business? Yeah, and what I have found- life, There's someone who's, who's right. you know. Right, what I have found is the common denominator, Richard, is it's not an industry. It's not a profession, it's mindset, truly. Um, when you are in a space where you know that you want to create and develop relationships that matter, I'm the person. So it, it, that's, yeah. it, and that's, pers that's my personal challenge actually. Like, oh, where do I go to serve? Because I love my work and I wanna do lots of it and I wanna help a lot of people. Well, I don't just work with this kind of person or this kind of profession. It's, it's really the human condition. Um, so it's, it's a little bit of a challenge on my end. Um, I, I knew it would be. So what I do is, as I take a group at a time, I find out what's going on for them. Who do I really want to serve? I would love to serve middle school teachers, frankly. <laughs> so, you know, the, the education and so forth, it's, it's so powerful. Not there to load up more on their plate, because I remember as a teacher, it was like, here, here's another program. Here's another program. Here's another program. Well, hang on a second. Where are the parents in all this? And if you're putting something on, I got to take something off. No, no, it's, it's the helping people just learn fundamental skills to get into and with and move forward with their everyday operations, feeling more confident and more competent with the relationships they have. Awesome. So. My next question for you is pretty simple. It's your superpower. If you said, if you could, if you could, uh, could nail down the one thing that you really do for your, your clients or for your organizations that you work with and uh, label it as a superpower, what would you say that is? Well, I, ha I do have a pretty amazing laugh, but um, I, I, <laughs> you do I, have a pretty amazing laugh. I, <laughs> people can hear me across the room. They'll tell me they hear me before they see me. Okay, great. Um, I think my superpower is the ability to give so much energy forward. It's the number one comment and compliment I get. Ginger, you have so much energy. And I used to think that was kind of pithy, Richard, but I don't believe that anymore. Mm -hmm. I know that when people come into a room, engage in a conversation, whatever that looks like, they want to be energized. They, they're looking for some inspiration. They're looking for somebody who can feed that energy. And that is one thing that I think I'm really good at. I love it. it it's natural for me. Now I do need to reload my own energy, <laughs> but, I, but I know how to do that. And By so way, to I, can, I can see that energy even in your photos, right? So like your, <laughs> the picture you have in your bio, like you can, you can see the energy in, in the picture. Oh, thank you. It's, it's fun. It's, it's incredibly rewarding to be able to give that. And if that makes a difference in somebody's day, Again, to me, it's not pithy, it's very real. Because when I meet somebody who I get something from, like, wow, that just shifted everything. And this is not woo, this is not the universe. Like, wow, if you're paying attention, there are people like this everywhere. How they give it out is different. Mine is kind of a full on fire hose. <laughs> yeah. yeah, energy gets people, the, people pay attention. Yes. Right. When you have energy, people pay attention. And when people pay attention, your message gets across. Yes, um, absolutely. So it's, it's, a, it's a medium of exchange. Um, so it's definitely not pithy. It's a, it's a powerful thing to have energy. And it's one of the things that like those of us who are not naturally energetic, right? You know, I'm, a, I'm, I'm naturally an introvert and I had to train myself to be an extrovert. Um, you have to learn to have energy and go through and teach yourself skills for having energy and sometimes even practice overacting, so to speak. So you are, 
so people are, are engaging and connecting with you. Um, and, you know, if you've ever spoken on stage or spoken on radio or anything like, you know, you know how much you have to, you have to have extra energy because you have to speak to the person at the back of the room. Um, and they have to see you the same way as the person who's sitting right next to you. Um, so it's definitely, it's a, it's a powerful skill. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. It's, it's uh, energy management. I like that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to use that somewhere and I'll say, well, Richard said it's energy management. It's true. And regardless of your vert status, by the way, um, I recently recorded a video on that and some people will, and, and you're not saying this, but some people will um, lean on the whole, well, I'm an introvert. What do I do about that? Okay, that's great. You know what? It doesn't matter what your vert status is. What matters is your intention. So if, if you're going to, like you said, that kind of force that, that extra energy, sometimes, yeah, you know what, sometimes we all have to tap into that. There's no doubt about it. Like I get tired too, but it's not, there's a, a lot more to unpack. We'll talk about that another time, but everybody can be a connector because we all have our own way of sharing energy forward. That's what we need to be aware of. What, what do I feel the best at? What do I feel the most confident at? How do I do that thing? In connecting in my own life with who I am. Yeah, that's one of those things that I've, uh, I've, uh, I've always felt the whole introvert extrovert is used as a cop out a lot for people. And the realization that um, really helped me was the idea that, you know, someone who is introverted versus extroverted naturally um, means that where they get their recharge from, like extroverted people go out and they spend time with people and they get recharged. And introverted people, they go out and spend time with people, they get discharged, and they have to go home and rest and recuperate, right? And but well, neither of those mean that you can't have a lot of energy and connection and passion when you're with people, right? So you can you can get um, even as as a as an introvert, you can have all the energy and the passion of if you're on stage or in a networking event or going to you know your kid's baseball thing. Doesn't matter what it is. It just you know you plan time to recharge later. <laughs> yeah, and I think that's an interesting, I've heard that definition a few places, and I, I respectfully, um, that's not my definition. You know, everybody's got their own. I'm, I am very outwardly energetic. Whatever that makes me verge status, I don't care, but I need lots of time by myself. I, I need to read. I need to sleep a lot. I need to cook. I want to do these things because that helps me. Do I get buzzed by being with a lot of other people? Yeah, if it's people I want to be around. Sometimes for me, that's even exhausting. But I, yeah. I think it's more important to take a look at, okay, what makes you hum? What's your why? And then figure out where you give your precious time, whether it's to yourself, someone else, and however that affects you. That's, you know, having the wherewithal to be really tuned into that, that is a really amazing skill that well, there's a lot of people much better at it than I am. But I learned as a connector, I'm getting really, really focused on where do I invest that time and energy and who am I giving it to because I want to, and who am I, who am I not giving it to because it's not going to be productive or it's, and, and productive isn't like a sales thing. It's, it's not going anywhere. So if it's not going anywhere, why are you doing it? Give yourself the permission. In my, in my book, The Canon, uh, I've got a, a chapter on permission slips because sometimes we don't let ourselves off the hook enough. And, yeah. and we need to take a call look that at permission that. to play. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You could probably call it lots of things, but like giving yourself permission first before you go out is really important. And that's, that's something that I don't think we're talking about enough. So in that vein of thinking, I'm going to derail my, our own conversation, but it's my podcast. So I can do that. <laughs> you mentioned you like to recharge by cooking and I like cooking too. I'm curious what, what kind of, uh, what kind of stuff you like to cook? Oh, wow. Great question. Well, then you're going to definitely have to come up here on your way, uh, way north in your travels. So you're welcome to come and I'll cook for you. Um, so my husband and I do a lot of dinner parties. One thing I've been doing, what, well, one thing I do a lot of is I do a lot of canning and preserving. Um, okay, so nice. we, yeah, we picked 145 pounds of cherries this year, which is crazy. Wow. What do you do with 145 pounds? We make maraschino cherries. We've frozen a ton. Well, not a ton, but a hundred pounds. Um, I also, I'm a from the hip cooker, meaning what do I have in the larder? What's fresh? What's available? What am I pulling out of my own garden and cooking in the moment? I like books as an inspiration and I, I appreciate the chemistry, but don't make me be a baker, Richard, because there's way too much like finite, do it this way and wash for this temperature. Yeah. Like, ah! Now, how do you like to cook? 
So um, you sound like you'd be a lot like my wife. My wife loves to like her favorite thing in the world is to uh, is to to find all the stuff that we have and make stuff out of it. Yeah. Um, that that like doesn't exist. <laughs> yeah. So so you and her would get along great. Um, and you know, like just this, you know, we, we went out to a uh, blueberry farm and got like, I don't know, three or four pounds of blueberries and she made blueberry jam and we made blueberry cookies and blueberry muffins and blueberry buckle and a few other things. Anyways, she likes to get stuff and then make whatever you can make out of it. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm more on the, uh, I like, I like to cook things that are ridiculously good. So my wife, for instance, doesn't let me do the grocery shopping. Because if I do the grocery shopping, we'll spend a thousand dollars for four meals. Um, <laughs> Let me help and, you, you know, that like budget if, so you can do that. <laughs> yeah, so like I'll I'll uh, um, when I cook, like my wife loves it when I cook because I'll you know I'll spend three hours making dinner and it's like I'll spend an hour you know roasting garlic and and uh, um, and you know basting it with with oils and spices and whatnot and then you know, make a brown butter ruse for my sauces. And, uh, and, you know, I just, I have an obscene level of patience when it comes to cooking. Um, and my, my wife is like, she's like, I cook because I want to eat food. And which means like, by the time she's gotten to cooking, she's already hungry. So she wants to cook it and eat it. And I'm like, I want to make something really delicious. And I don't care how long it takes. So anyways, that's sort of how I am with the cooking. But yeah. Yeah, that's great. An obscene level of patience. I'm gonna remember that. I, I do on some things, but I, I, I need to premeditate sometimes. Oh yeah, and like for, I have uh, one of those type A personalities where I like to have all my ducks in a row. So like the mise en place in cooking is just, it's my happy place. I love, I will spend half an hour chopping and cutting vegetables and putting them all in their own little jars and like <laughs> measuring all my ingredients out and having it all ready to go. Um, which just drives my wife bonkers because she's the kind of person who's, she's making soup and she's like, gets to the point where she's putting the vegetables in and she's like, oh crap, I forgot the carrots. Pull them out of the, you know, the uh, refrigerator, chop them all up while it's on the stove. Um, and like, that would just drive me nuts. I couldn't handle that. So, <laughs> so are you in the kitchen at different times then? Is that it? Um, yeah, we're either in the kitchen at different times or we actually work pretty well together because I'll do all the mise en place and then she'll cook and then she's like, oh man, like everything, I've got everything ready. It's great. Um, <laughs> so, so we work together well in the kitchen that way. But that's anyways, cool. that's, that's one of, uh, you know, to our point we were talking about, that's one of the things that uh, my wife and I both like to do for recharging is we'll spend time cooking and having a good time. And, you know, it's a, it's, it's a, a play thing for us is we Excellent. cook and have a good time with that. Right so. On. Next question, other side of the superpower is the fatal flaw, right? All of the heroes have a fatal flaw, whether that's Superman and his kryptonite or Batman, who's not actually super. What would you say you have in your life that's held your business back? Sorry, there's a lag and time. more importantly, more importantly, what have you done to help sort of overcome that? So anyone else who might be, uh, who suffer from something similar can, can learn from your, your mistake or mistakes, depending on how many you've got. <laughs> I have never been asked for a fatal flaw. I think that's a really interesting question. Um, I actually discourage people from answering what's your biggest weakness because I don't think we should focus on it. However, um, this is an interesting thing. I would say that what I can teach somebody to avoid is to not waste time thinking about making the decision. Make the damn decision and move Absolutely. forward. Absolutely. Right? So with my Women Enjoying Beer, for example, full-on, full-fledged business, my first book was based on the research I did for that. It was, it's completely legit, still a viable business. I don't pursue it um, actively anymore. But I, if I were to push the rewind button, I would figure out why I felt stalled out much earlier. And what I would do specifically in that is I would hire a coach. I would, I would ask my friends, I would ask valued associates, I would ask connections who I trusted, who I knew would tell it to me straight and say, okay, I'm feeling this way. This is what I've done. This is what I think is going on. Who do you recommend that I get in touch with and see if they're a good fit? I've learned in the last four or five years of my life, Richard, with the benefit of hiring different coaches, I mean, five or six different programs of all kinds of makes and models. If any of your listeners have questions on this, I'm happy to answer some of this because a coach helps you learn in three hours what you would take three years to, to learn by yourself. Yeah, figure out on your own. 
Yeah. There's a reason why it's a massive industry and you got to be careful and pick a coach wisely. Don't just take it on the word of somebody that you like or a friend or, I mean, don't mess around with Yelp or anything like that. Like this is an extremely personal decision. So you need to do your diligence and find somebody who can help support you in what that is, whether it's a one-time discovery session or a year long program or mastermind, whatever it is. So I would go back and say, all right, I'm spinning my wheels and I'm spinning them more and more. What is going on? And I would figure that out. So I'm an impatient person. They didn't have the example um, of somebody like that I was close to who had a coach. And maybe they did, but I just didn't know it. But I, I, now that I know that there's this incredible community of all these just massively different coaches, uh, all makes and models, size, shapes, colors, you name it. I'm like, wow, I am never not going to have a coach. So a superpower that you, a, a super uh, flaw is kind of an interesting word, but so if you're, if you're stuck on something, find some help and don't wait. Yeah, I really love that because it's something that um, I think a lot of us struggle with, right? Are we, I, I use the word flaw not because I think we should focus on our flaws, but because, you know, we all have things we struggle with. And it's interesting to see other people who are successful and realize that, you know, once you've gotten to a certain place, we all had to, we all had to climb the mountain, right? We had to, we had to, to do the work and it's not always easy and we have things we have to get over and figure out. Um, and so hearing from other people, I think is really a, a, it's a benefit to those of us who are on that journey still, um, to see where, where the problems are. So, um, that one, like the, the, you said something earlier, make the damn decision. Right. And that, that is such a, um, I don't remember where specifically I remember learning that, but I remember it was, it was something along the lines of, um, that one of my favorite quotes is money loves speed, wealth loves time. All right. And if you're building a business, one of the key things, if you need to get money in the door is learn how to make decisions because money loves speed. Right. And if you don't have speed, you're not going to have cash flow, right? You're not going to have the stuff that's going to bring right. money in the door. Right. Um, and, and, you know, to the other side of that, it's never going to generate wealth, right? So wealth is going to be the stuff that you take time and you build and you build something that's going to last. But cash flow is the thing that's going to, it's going to be the heartbeat that makes your business go. So you have to know how to do both of those things, how to take time and how to build something that's going to last, but you also have to know how to make decisions and move quickly. Yes. Um, and um, anyways, it's a, it's a, it's a powerful thing. And I don't know how to teach people how to do that. It's just something you sort of have to bite the bullet and realize that the vast majority of the time, the things that you're vacillating on are, you know, they're, Either way, whatever decision you make, it's not the end of the world, right? You're not going to cause the apocalypse, right? The, the worst possible situation is something that you could come back from readily, right? And right. <laughs> you just have you to make forward, your own have to make the decision. You right. You make your own apocalypse. That's a good word. If you don't make a decision, you get stalled on this mm -hmm. paralysis by analysis, Bologna. My uh, A good friend of mine, Bree Seely, who is an amazing coach, she and I were talking. In fact, I, I tapped in her. I'm like, Bree, I need, I need some help from you. She's a, she's a peer and a friend. And um, one of her things is she says, look, you know, some people look at hiring a coach as a risk. I get that. At the same time, we're looking at the wrong thing. We're looking at, oh, what if I spend this money and it doesn't work? That's not what we're talking about here, Richard, right? Because the bigger risk is if we don't invest in ourselves. Yeah, you you want to be in the same place in a month, in a year, in eight years. You want to look back at that and say, oh, yeah, no, I'm fine. Well, fine is a four letter word. So your, your money loves speed, the wealth loves time. I love that. I'm going to use that one too, because if you are trying to get the speed, then guess what? There are lots of ways to do it. You can still work for somebody else. You can, you can do whatever that takes to support. Marie Forleo is brilliant about it too. She says, for seven years, I worked part-time jobs because I knew my dream was ahead of me. And that was part of it. It wasn't divorced from it. It was part of it that helped me build to where I am now. And I, that for me was a real, okay, there's no, there's no shame. There's no embarrassment. There's no anything to saying, look, yeah, I have my dream and I'm bringing it to life at whatever speed I can bring it to life. And in the meantime, I'm also doing this thing because that buys the groceries that, you know, brings, puts the electricity on and so forth. I think that's great. Whatever your equation is, but make the decision. Yes. Make a quick decision and do it. 
So yep. my next question for you has to do with the common enemy. The uh, common enemy is, think of it like this. When you first bring on a client or an organization or someone um, who you're working with, and they have a specific, um, if you could, you know, wave your magic wand, so to speak, and remove a mindset or remove a, something that's holding them back, and just immediately that you know they would get a rapid jump forward, what would that common enemy be? Um, and, you know, I, I realize we don't have a magic wand, so you have to actually work and do those things. But if you did have a magic wand, what would the one thing you would just remove immediately when you brought someone on? I would remove people's own self-limiting beliefs. And here's a perfect example. A client I worked with recently um, brought me in to uh, enhance their education program that they already offer, their train, full training program, which is fantastic. And I gave a first round of two intended rounds of classes on connectivity, communication, courage, a whole bunch of things that go with that. The feedback from the team through my client, they felt like there was something wrong that my client, their, their training director, was trying to fix. Wow, that was a big, huge learning curve because what they saw was, oh, you're telling me something's wrong with me. No, no, no. What we're trying to do is help you look ahead and say, we can all improve. We can all, we can all make ourselves better. We can all do these things. And connectivity is one of these avenues where if we really dial into it and let, again, just let your shoulders drop and take in, like Bo Eason says, take the coaching. If you let those self-limiting beliefs, like, oh, they think something's wrong with me. I'm going to get fired. There's something bad. Like if we get rid of the negative stuff, then we can really dig into it. And uh, that common enemy gets d diminished. What you don't feed doesn't survive. So if you don't feed it, you won't perpetuate it. And even if it's still there, because there's usually a little tiny, you know, something yapping at our heels, but if you don't feed it, if you, if you banish that common enemy very intentionally, eventually it will go away. But you have to feed the whatever the opposite of the, not the enemy, the, the hero. Perfect. For the show, you have to, you have to feed the hero part of that story in order for the enemy to see that, oh, I'm not, I'm not going to win this. And you have to stay on it. So the negative mindset that can hold people back, like, oh, if I hire a coach, that means something wrong with me. Or if I hire a speak, why should I pay somebody to speak? Everybody can speak. Well, that's absolutely patently untrue. It's a real profession because you're asking for expertise that nobody else has. If you're looking for training, oh, well, we can do this in-house. We don't need to pay you. Okay, good luck with that. And, and I mean that at the same yeah. time, it's not going to be the same training because we're not the same people. So no matter what you quote do, you're the only one that can do it. So the common enemy has to be something that you can overcome, that you can help other people banish, so to speak, and really make progress. Yeah, and I know like the, one of the most important things that I've realized in my life and in the training I do with my clients is that the reason someone's going to pay me or pay my clients or pay you as a speaker or pay a coach or pay anyone for anything is not necessarily for the message that's delivered or the goods that are delivered or the service that's delivered. It's that plus the perspective of the one delivering it, right? Because the perspective of the one delivering it, they've been there, they've done that, they've got a different perspective, they've got different stories, they've got a different understanding of what's going on. And that perspective is what makes your product or your service or your coaching or your deliverables unique, what yes. makes you stand out. Um, and it's, uh, it's just such an important part of, uh, of that discussion. Yes, you're so. absolutely right, Richard. The perspective is what people essentially, if you want to boil it down, perspective is what people pay for, because if they had your perspective, you wouldn't be needed, but they don't because you do have this unique vantage point. Nobody else has run your miles. Nobody else has been in your shoes. And so that's the value if we talk about the V word and value isn't necessarily money, it's part of it, but the value is what, ow, I really connected with that person. There's something there and therefore it's this self-fulfilling prophecy that if I connect with you and I, I not, I, it's not about liking what you say, but it's about finding resonance. Like, oh, now I get it. Oh, he's got a piece of his story that makes sense with my story. Now I found a way forward. You're absolutely right. Perspective is is huge so important yeah perspective is like i said it's the value and i think 
it's 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 such a misunderstood concept on both sides of the equation someone who's buying and someone who's selling the people who are selling don't value their own perspective so they undervalue their services and their goods um and or they don't speak about it in their marketing um, right. right. So you have that problem. And then on the other side, the people who are buying don't always understand that what they're buying is they're buying the perspective. Right. 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 Um, and so it's it's a it's a problem on both sides. And the the companies and the people and the individuals who really understand that do a great job of marketing their perspective and marketing the storytelling that goes with it. Um, yep. and anyways, yeah. So agreed. That's a that's a cool discussion. We could probably spend an entire podcast just talking about that. I think so. That. <laughs> it's a valuable one too, as we both know. It's really important because people are like, okay, yeah. how does this rubber really hit the road? How do I make a living? How do I use this for traction, which we all find in our own ways? Yeah. So my next question for you, um, we talked about this, you talked about this briefly already, and I want you to, to go over a little more in depth, right? So if your common enemy is what you fight against, your um, your driving force is what you fight for, right? So just like uh, you know, Google fights to index all the world's um, information, or you know, Spider Man fights to save New York. What is it that you fight for? When I was a little kid, I wasn't shy, but I wasn't overly outgoing. And as I became a middle schooler and then a high schooler, the world was different. It, I wasn't a popular kid. I wasn't, I wasn't banished. I wasn't a bad kid or anything like that. I was just a kid. And then I went to college and college is where I came into my own Richard. And I realized that I was no longer my sister's sister. I wasn't my parents' daughter. I was me. And that was a real eye-opener. And, and it's not that any of those people held me back. They didn't. I had a very supportive, loving home, just totally wonderful, super grateful. But the driving force probably kicked in then because I realized that for the first time ever, I get to invent me. And I get to be responsible for all the parts of it. <laughs> so hopefully there's-, there's For better or for worse, I, right? I can't believe I did that moment for the wrong reasons and more, and more of the, I can't believe I just did that, you know, that kind of thing, right? I can do this. And so, so the, the driving force to me is who am I and what kind of impact can I have in the world? I wouldn't have used those words as an early 20 year old, but I do now a few decades past that because the driving force to me, especially with connectivity is that I have experienced firsthand, talk about perspective, how learning to be confident and competent, it's not about comfort, but confidence and competence in who I am and sharing that forward is incredibly powerful. That is my driving force. I want to connect the world and I want to help the world learn how to connect as well because I have seen it work. I have testimony from people who say, Ginger, until I got your book, I wasn't sure how to do this thing. And there's a, for example, there's a gentleman in my own community. I held a meetup for several months and he came to it. Older gentleman retired, his partner had died. He was hungry for connection. He just wanted to meet people. Um, and he said, how do I approach, for example, the front desk person at my gym and not have them feel like it's creepy? Wow, great question, right? We're all hungry for connection, but we're all also, our yeah. hands are slightly up of like, oh, well, what does this person want? We think there's an ulterior motive. Like, he wrote me after he bought my book and he said, Ginger, now that I, you know, I get it. And he gave me some specifics and it was so, it was so humbling and so rewarding to read that, Richard, that that one piece of advice, that something that he took and actively plugged into his life, that's my driving force. When I hear those stories, when people are like, oh, that one thing you taught us, that was worth it. Oh, great. We are both successful. There's a lot more where that came from. But that driving force of helping people feel confident and competent in walking up to somebody they've never met before or re-engaging with somebody who they haven't spoken with for a long time, that's a really powerful force for me. So that's actually, it's really interesting because it's a great transition into the next question I want to ask. But the uh the 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 thing that like that strikes me there is like i've 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 had what, whatever skill set that is i've got it right where I, i'm comfortable walking up and talking to pretty much anyone mm -hmm. but i couldn't enumerate it to someone else right i couldn't you know because people ask me all the time they're like how come you can just go up to anyone and say hi and like make a relationship and have them not feel like you're being creepy or weird and i'm like i don't know it's just who i am right mm -hmm. so i don't have a good answer for that so next question is your hero's tool belt 
right? So every hero has their tool belt, right? Maybe that, you know, Batman's got his cool little belt full of goodies and Thor has his magical hammer. What are some of the tools that you use to help people do what you do? Yeah, great questions, Richard. <laughs> Hero's tool belt, what are some of the tools I have? Well, I have the framework. And so the seven elements of connectivity. When I decided to get into connectivity, I wanted to be crystal clear on my message. I knew what it was to me, but I needed to be able to, uh, just like you said, enumerate it, to explain it to other people and have them be clear on what it is according to what my definition is. So I wrote the book so I was clear. Like I didn't write the book for an ego charge. It, my picture's not even in the book. I don't care about that. What I care about is that it's a tool. So that's a tool in my belt because I wrote my own tool belt, so to speak. Like, here's how it breaks yeah. down. People would ask me, just like they asked you, how are you able to walk up to somebody? So I stepped back and I thought, huh, they honestly don't know. And they honestly want to know. How can I help them with that? So that framework became apparent, seven steps, um, seven components, seven elements. And so those are... That's one of my tools. Um, there's, there's several tools in my tool belt. Another one is um, pa what I call POW, positive, objective, and willing. A connector's mindset is positive, objective, and willing. And it just happens to make a little clever <laughs> um, uh, uh, acronym. Uh, and it's true. It's absolutely dang true. I'm not going to use something glib unless I believe in it. So being positive has everything to do with you being able to walk up to somebody, right? Like, okay. What's the worst that can happen? Probably not the worst that can happen. It's probably going to be great or at least mediocre. You know, there's nothing wrong with mediocre and you just keep moving. That objectiveness, <laughs> that, that mindset of like, okay, let's go meet somebody because there's somebody great out there that having that willingness, some people call it open-mindedness. I like objective, use whatever one you want. And then that willingness, that taking that first literal step forward. Oh, look, somebody's over there in the park by themselves. I'm going to go find out what's going on. So that POW is a huge thing for me. One of the other most important things I can, I can stress and share today, Richard, is that open-ended questions are queen. If you want to start a conversation, it is not about you. It's not. Don't go into your latest tirade. Don't go into your latest me story. Ask about them. Connectors are interested. They are curious. They, it's not that they put themselves last, but the person they put first is that other person. Let's see where this can go. And it's so powerful to be able to ask a safe, pleasant, open-ended question. Those are first, that's in the first move in the framework. Like ask, yeah. engage, do something. As a traveler, you're having hundreds of these conversations, right? So how do we- master it. Yeah, how do I do this without the creep factor, without somebody feeling weird? You know, it's a simple open. I'll give you some examples. So say you and I are at the bus stop together. Um, I could ask you something simple like, um, do you know if the bus is on time? It's extremely neutral. Everybody would have some sort of response. You're not putting them on the spot. You're not creeping out. You're just asking a question that they might even have. And oh gosh, I don't know. Let's ask this other person. Or I don't know. Let's get my phone out and see. You know. So all of a sudden, you've made what I call a first move. You've made the first step towards connectivity. If you want to, um, uh, another one would be, well, what's what's a great thing about your week so far? Love that question because it's positive. Everybody has something, and even if they come back and say, yeah, I've been having a crappy week, blah, 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 you can potentially make their week better by letting them know you care, because that first move, yeah. that engagement in a conversation is all about helping somebody understand that they are seen and they have value. Here's a, I was at a, I was at a um, coaching event a couple months ago, uh, it was in Phoenix, Arizona, and there were big long lunch breaks and we walked to a park and you're looking around the park. It's a pretty busy park. I'm looking around and, and there's a, there's a band playing or there's music playing some, some sort of kind of dance, get up and like, Oh yeah, I know this song. And um, everybody's just kind of pleasantly listening to it as they're eating lunch. And there was this one woman wandered into the park. I, I think she was home free. She had several big bags with her and so forth. And, and um, she put her bags down next to a table and she started dancing. She was a phenomenal dancer, Richard. And I was, I, was, I was so glued to watching her. I'm like, wow, she has a story that I want to know. And, and I'm watching and I'm watching and, and, and finally it's time for us to go back to the, the event. And I thought, I'm not going to miss this opportunity. So we walked over towards her 
And I, I didn't get too close because proximity um, has an impact on connecting. Um, and I simply, I probably got a couple feet away from her. I wasn't afraid of her, but I didn't know her and I didn't know, you know, not everybody's going to react, um, the same way. So you just want to be respectful of that. And I said, I really appreciated watching you dance. Thanks. And she smiled back. She gave me a, a hand gratitude sign and I walked on. I was so glad that I didn't let that opportunity go by because I wasn't there to stroke her ego. I wanted her to know that what she did made my day a little bit better. And how often do we let those go by? Too often. It doesn't take very much to connect with somebody. And that's, that's a coming and going. I may never see her again. It, and it doesn't matter. That's not the point. The point is that I wanted to let her know. I wanted to connect with her and tell her I appreciated her. Because I bet it's been a really long damn time since somebody said something positive or even kind to her. And again, I'm not trying to be a martyr. Yeah, I'm just absolutely. Saying, what can I do in that moment? Because I would want that in return. Connectors pay it forward, full speed. It's a, uh, so great. It's a, um, what do you call it? Uh, so two things. One, getting good at asking questions yes. is a superpower in and of itself. Yes. The second one is the ability to give a good heartfelt compliment yes um and they're great opportunities to open up um and start conversations like one of the things that i do all the time is uh you know we, we travel in rv parks and you know mm -hmm. someone pulls in next to you and you watch them back their trailer up right or back their rv up i'll get out and introduce myself and say hey you know i watched you back that up you did a fantastic job right i know on. how hard that is right i do it all the time and right. and like yeah. there's nothing to that other than just acknowledging that i know how difficult what you just did is and i watched you do it and it was great Right? Yeah. And it starts it starts relationships yes. um, and and so being able to give a heartfelt compliment um, and to to people is a great way to to start that conversation and get things going um, and yeah I, lo I just I love the, uh, the the idea of having a set of tools that you can give someone yeah because uh, because what, what I call it is uh, you know between between stimulus and response there is choice right mm -hmm. and someone who is a master of something mm -hmm. the stimulus and the response are very close together right so sure. they they um they are they don't have to think about the thing that they're doing right? right so what you've done with connection is you've spread apart the stimulus and the response and you've put in your seven step system so someone can learn the steps master the steps and then shrink them back together again and become over time bring that together and have it become a natural skill yeah. Right. And that's, that's really where you come and you can help someone is you can help them do that thing where you can have them come in and learn how to do connection and have it be as natural as it is for you or for me. Right. You're absolutely right. I, 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 I call it an accordion and I like your between stimulus and response. There's that choice. And so then in the choice is the how to, and a lot of people have the yeah. stimulus and they want to respond, but they don't know how. And so giving, giving them the tools for that, and I guess my mm -hmm. hardware background is appropriate there. I do have a beautiful leather tool belt that I definitely wear and use. <laughs> I wore it during my TED talk with my 16 ounce S-Wing uh, comfort handle hammer. So <laughs> tools are important. <laughs> nice. Excellent. That's a great Yeah, one. and I love, I love, like, if you, think, if you think about it, right, when you see the lady dancing, that's a stimulus and the choice is to go over and talk to her and ha give her a compliment and that's the response right, right. Um, so between stimulus and response there's always a choice and you're looking at how do you train that so that the desire to give the compliment or to ask the open-ended question or to create the connection is a natural response and that's going to happen with practice and with you know with time and with effort and stuff like that so really really cool what I want to do is I want to um, transition to one of the last questions of the show. I think there's two more. One of the, the next one is about um, your heroes, right? So every hero has their heroes, right? You know, Luke and uh, what is his name? Um, I'm going to forget the other guy's name. Frodo had a uh, Gandalf, right? We all have those people. Who were some of those heroes in your life? Were they mentors? Were they coaches? Were they authors? Were they peers who were just a few years ahead? And how important were they to the success and influence that you enjoy today in your career? The Hero Show will be right back. Are you tired of trying to write webinars that don't consistently convert? 
How would you like to have a webinar that effortlessly created sales in your online business? You can. Introducing the Webinar Alchemy Workshop. Webinar Alchemy Workshop is an online masterclass that will help you write incredibly persuasive webinars for your online courses quickly and easily. Using what you learn in this class, you can build a webinar that educates your entire audience while still creating sales. For a limited time, you can purchase this masterclass for only $7, and you'll get the exact framework I've personally used to help my clients sell more than a million dollars worth of online coaching and training just over the last year. Simply text the word ALCHEMY, A-L-C-H-E-M-Y, to 444-999, and I'll send you all the details. The music is by Purple Planet Music. Visit www.purple-planet.com. And now, back to the show. Well, who were some of those heroes in your life? Were they mentors? Were they coaches? Were they authors? Were they peers who were just a few years ahead? And how important were they to the success and influence that you enjoy today in your career? Hmm. Who are my heroes? Um, some are living, some are dead. And so a, a couple of uh, dead ones, to put it quite bluntly, um, are people- The dead heroes. Who are, yeah, well, you know, there's, um, Eleanor Roosevelt blows my mind. I would love to have her over for dinner because her, her compassion, her diplomacy, wow, give me a big old helping of that. Um, she's nothing short of remarkable. You know, we all have our own warts. At the same time, she chose to find the positive and she chose to work for it. It doesn't just happen. This is not fairy dust, people. Like being a hero takes work. You've got to be willing to do the thing. And she was willing to do the thing in all kinds of circumstances. So she's somebody I have long looked up to. Um, I think Gina Davis is flat out remarkable. I've supported her Gina Davis uh, Institute on Gender Studies in the Media for quite some time. I had the pleasure of meeting her a few years ago. I was like, I was, I don't get starstruck. I'm like, this is so cool. Because what I admire about her is her proactivity. She for her to start the institute, she said, look, I can walk into a director's office, being at the stage of her career she is, I can walk into their office, they know who I am, we have a real conversation, and I can change something tomorrow by the enlightenment of what she shares with them. And that's really powerful to me. She's using her own driving force for good. So I think she's a pretty remarkable person. Whole bunch of people that um, your audience can check out. Some people who I just personally know, who I think are remarkable. Some of my coaches, Maribel Jimenez, who's now a friend because I, I often <laughs> see people I admire. I'm like, I want to know them more than just skin deep. I, I, they're doing amazing things, and I want to support them. And the best way I can support them is to get to know them. So I've, I've targeted certain people that I've, I've seen doing things that I'm like, wow, I have a lot to learn. I want to do what I can to support them. And I want to start a real friendship or relationship. So there's a lot of people like that out there. Julia Hurst, um, Rob Hill, I could just, I could name off a whole bunch of people. I feel really fortunate in a lot of ways, Richard, in that I, I listen to my own driving force of connectivity and knowing that people are people. They're just, we're all just people. We're all just as normal as we can be. And everybody is hungry for some level of connection. You alluded to it earlier of, of the a genuine, a heartfelt um, compliment is how you put it. The, the genuineness is where you make traction. Um, I can think of some big names, for example, in the beer community who I, I still have their phone numbers in my cell phone. I can call these people. I'm on a first name basis. They know who I am. They would take my call. Um, and, and they're rock stars in the beer industry. And people would like, you know, they, they just, they throw themselves at certain people because they're just like, they got the cool factor. They want to hang out with them. Well, these are people I know, but I've been very intentional about yeah. wanting to get to know them as a person. They're not, they're not any different than us. They simply have created a unique space in this world. So um, my fine husband, who was just in the background, <laughs> um, he, uh, he's a hero to me in, in his own way because I've learned a lot from him. And um, we are very complimentary, I'll say in lots of ways. I, I also, at this stage of my life, at any stage of your life, really, here's a piece of advice. At any stage of your life, get really clear on who your people are and figure out who they are because, first of all, they're all around you. You get to pick and choose. Nobody is forcing you to be friends or liking or Facebook. It's not followers. It's not about numbers. It's a quality game. So those heroes, whoever is a hero to me in whatever context that is, 
they have chosen to do something that I admire, that resonates with me, that I know I can learn from, that I can perhaps emulate and share forward with somebody else. So I, I got a lot of gratitude for a lot of people, Richard. And I mean, even like this, this is our first time meeting. I'm super grateful that you were willing to have this conversation and willing to engage with it. I can't wait for the for more in the future. You know, you're, everything's possible. And so lead with your best foot and then see where you can give and, and where it can go. So one of the things you said there that I really want to, I want to pull out, make sure people caught because I think it's really important is you said that heroes are people too, right? Yes. Right. So the people that you look up to in your life, right? Whether, you know, it doesn't matter how far ahead they are, right? You could be talking about, you know, President Barack Obama or Trump, pick your flavor, right? Or just your, the, the local author that, you know, is, you know, has changed your life. Um, right. Someone who's a hero in your life will just like you and I. And if you sit down across from the dinner table from them, if you can ask them interested, open-ended questions yes. and be interested in them, they will love you just as much as anyone else, right? It's the, uh, you know, because that's the way connection works. It doesn't matter if, you know, they're, they're the ruler of the free world or they run the coffee shop down the street. People are people and connection is the same right it's the uh the old the old adage if you ever read anything in the uh the pickup artist world um i think what is it neil strauss is in that space his his book's really good and one of the things that he talks about is like the guys a lot of time they go into a bar and the the quote unquote the tens in the bar never get any attention because they feel like they're you know everyone who would would want to connect with them feels like they're unattainable right mm -hmm. because they're they're too good or they're too big or they're too whatever, right? But they're just people, they're just women, right? And mm -hmm. just like you and me. And so it doesn't matter if it's someone, you know, like in my life, um, one of my heroes for a long time is now a close personal friend. And, you know, we've done client work both ways with each other. And we, you know, I know he'd pick up the phone and take my call if I called him. And a lot of that comes from just understanding he's a normal person, just like me. Nice. And he likes to have friendships and likes to have people that'll push him and challenge him and ask him questions and care about what he's doing. Right. right. And that's all it takes. It doesn't matter that he's, you know, his business is a hundred times bigger than mine and his influence is a hundred times larger than mine. Right. That, that stuff falls away when you have authentic connection. Yes. Yes. Because influence and, and some of those things that we define as quote success, you know, it's all relative. You're absolutely right, Richard. Who cares if you have a hundred million dollars unless, I mean, getting to the top by yourself is not the way to get to the top of whatever heap you want to climb on because then it's lonely. No, no, <laughs> the smartest people have <laughs> other people that surround this friend you have. I, I'm sure he's so glad to hear from you whenever he does and you're glad to hear from him. It, it's got to be real. It's got to be based in a human to human connection, not a fan base, not a, not a creepy uh, way you look at. Yeah, there's so many, so many things. I just read an article about Madonna and how um, her, what her life is like now and where she came from and how she got through a lot of that. So like those people are still people and they're just craving something normal. Um, and, and we just get to define what our normal is. Yeah. And I think one of the things that's really hard as you become more successful is realizing that people start to recognize you. Right. And, uh, like I've had this experience a couple of times, you go to an event in like my industry and people recognize me there and you get, you know, I, I don't know what the term is, right? You know, fangirled, right? That kind of thing. People right. are like, hey, I know who you, you've done this thing. And, and right. uh, like, I, I can't imagine what that's like if you're, you know, if you're a Trump or a Madonna or, you know, Obama or something like that, where wherever you go, no one treats you like a human being because you're, I don't know, you're so famous. Yeah, right? And, right. You almost become yeah. impersonal because they put you on this pedestal, but, but that's not, that's not helpful. You look at somebody like Lady Gaga, who's been brilliant about her little monsters and how she knows that those people helped her. So she will never forget them. She'll never leave them out. And she pays attention. You know, that's what it's about. Yeah. Um, so anyways, that, yeah, that's a, such an interesting discussion and like learning how to, to, uh, so we, we look at, we look at human connection, like up and down a hierarchy right, a hierarchy of success and influence and money and whatever those things are, and realize that those hierarchies don't actually exist, not on the connection level, right? They, they might actually exist in terms of like, you know, they might actually have more influence or more money than you, but when it comes to connection, those things don't really matter. No, we all, we all have our own circle 
And if they overlap, great. Because if they overlap and they can be powerful for good, that's terrific. Uh, that's, to me, what I seek out also in new connections and how I want to support new connections too. Okay, where is that? Who are their people? And how can I get more people swirling and overlap and so forth? And to me, it's fun because like, oh, okay. So Richard does something um, quote different than I do yet. We have a lot of alignment. So where is that alignment? Where does, where do those circles overlap? And what can I, a connector will think about it. Like, what can I do to support, help nudge and, and make that person better, stronger with, with what I have, because in the, that's how we get better, stronger all the time. Oh man, can you imagine what our world would be like from a political standpoint if we would just look at each other that way instead of you know whatever's going on right now? <laughs> let's 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 aim for that for sure. We're all capable. Yeah. We have to be we have to be com confident and competent. Circling back to those to speak up mm -hmm. and and share your message and realize that uh, that you know for the most part the overwhelming majority of us have the same goals, right? And we want more connection we want better results for ourselves for our family for our friends that kind of stuff you know it would change the world i bet so i think you're doing powerful work okay. so last thing here i want to bring it home for our listeners and talk about your guiding principles so okay. guiding principles top one or two things that you do on a daily basis right actions that you take on a daily basis that you think contribute or drive your success in your business top things i do on a daily basis to drive my success um, well, focus is a constant work in progress. Uh, no doubt about it. A lot of people will try to sell you a formula, figure out the formula that works for you. So one of the things that I have kept since I was a sophomore in college, so a few years ago, <laughs> is a hard copy date book. Without it, I would forget what I need to do and it helps keep me organized. So this is one of my superpower tools. Um, my hero tools because I like, I can see my life. I can map it out. I can decide, does it change? Well, of course it does. That's life. But using that as uh, a daily tool for me to keep focus uh, is really, really important. Um, something else I do every day is I am a voracious reader, Richard, and I get so much value and worth and growth and enjoyment, pleasure, from reading. Uh, I'm a pretty fast reader. I read dozens and dozens of books a year <laughs> because I'm, I just, I just, I am so interested and I'm a fast reader and, and I love it. Like I'll rip through a bunch of, I'm in some young adult right now books. They're fantastic. It's just so refreshing. And there's that middle school probably coming back, but, um, oh, I love young adult fiction. It's my favorite. It's great. It's so you suspend your judgment, you suspend belief and you get into that story. To me, that's what life is about. So there's a huge analogy. So, so I, not, to, not to derail it too much, but I think one of my favorite reasons for young adult fiction is that young adult fiction, generally you get to have a lot of the fantasy and the adventure without a lot of the adult themes. And sometimes you just want to break from the adult themes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Whether that's relationship trauma or you know death and murder and some of those things that you get into in more of the adult fiction and you just get to have I don't know, fun. Young yes. adult fiction, I think, is some of the most, the most fun fiction there is. I would agree. It's in a play on words. It's, it's, it's unadulterated fun because, you know, it's not, yeah. yeah, it's not modified by some of the harsher realities that people perpetuate, but it's, there's, mm -hmm. they're great stories. You can lose yourself in them and so forth. So reading is really important to me. I do that every single day. Um, I also need to get out and like, move my body. I, I walk a lot. I garden. I cook because there's a lot of physicality in that. I play with my dog, my kids, my, my, my dogs are my kids, let's be clear. <laughs> um, so it's, it's taking care of myself so I can build this empire, so I can have the impact, so I can help other people live their lives. Some people are like, yeah, yeah, that's all big, but how do you make that happen? Well, you know, get in touch with me and we'll have another conversation and I'll tell you more. But um, sure. being organized is, is something that I need to do so I feel clear or at least I have a direction. So I want to, I want to, call something out for my viewers on this show real quick. I think we're on episode like 30 or 35, somewhere around there um, for this interview here that we're doing. And I asked the same question about tools on every episode. And how, just off the top of your head, what would your guess be the number of people who say that their calendar is something they live and die by to run a successful business? Wow, that's a great question. Um, I think not enough of them. 
it's surprisingly for me i was it's not something i expected when i was getting this question almost every single one of the people i have on the show says that they they live and die by their calendar in one way or another whether it's their electronic calendar or their scheduling calendar or their daily planner um interesting they that that how common the calendar is for success well it makes it makes sense because if you're going to plan it's that old adage right plan a fail to plan plan to fail you know if mm -hmm. i have i can map things out i like paper because i this eraser this is forgiveness right here richard <laughs> i can change my plans i don't want to have to turn on an electronic device to see what's going on first thing in the morning when i'm all groggy and i'm just getting into my day and i just i don't want to be peaceful i don't want a screen um and so that's great to hear because there's so many different planners out there and one of these days i'm going to write my own because i haven't found the exact one for me because we have our own groove but uh, it's it's super helpful. It's my friend. I my I, I like I travel with it, and it, you know it does, I don't sleep with it. I'm not goofy like that. But it's it's really important because it helps me see the progress. Yeah, and I'm 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 the same way. I have to use a digital one because if it's paper, I lose it. Like like I have to actually give my wife checks and money that we get because if you know like straight up, I have I have a problem that if it's paper, <laughs> I will I will, it's just gonna go away. Um, so like I have, I'm not kidding. I have thrown away checks before, before cash. <laughs> so, um, I don't do well with paper, but the electronic stuff I can keep track of and right. keep up with. Um, right. so, but I, the same thing I have to, I, I have everything on my calendar, my, you know, uh, you know, I like having it, the tablet's really nice cause it's big giant thing. You can see the yeah. whole calendar, all the things that are laid out and, <laughs> you, know, you can zoom into your day and see all the things you have on there. So I love my calendar. It's great. Excellent. Um, so. Anyways, that basically finishes up the interview, but I do have one more thing I wanna ask you. This is something that I do on every show. I call it the Heroes Challenge. Heroes Challenge is really simple. Basically, do you have someone in your life or in your network that you think has a really great entrepreneurial story? Question is, who are they? First names are fine. We can connect on details later. And second, more importantly, why do you think they should come on the show and share their story? Okay, how many do you want? Just one. <laughs> Oh, it's hard. You got to pick one. It is. <laughs> That's what we call it the challenge. It's that desert island question. What one album? Oh, don't make me do that. <laughs> <laughs> um, what's one hero off the top of my head? I'm going to say Kenyatta Turner. Do you know Kenyatta yet? I don't, but I look forward to meeting her. You're gonna. She's a firecracker. We met in Arizona and we've kicked it off. And so I will send you the resulting uh, connection and introduction. And anybody else who's listening, Kenyatta uh, Turner, she's a remarkable person making really positive change in lots of ways. She's, she's effervescent, she's smart, she's funny, and she's always ready to grab a refreshment with somebody who wants to connect with her. I love her dearly. Awesome. Yeah. So we'll connect after the show and, uh, and see about getting her on the show. We actually make up these little cool little challenge videos and send them off to them as a, Hey, you, Great. you know, um, you were challenged to be on the show by, uh, by our guests and we send them off. It's pretty cool. Um, That's and brilliant. we've actually had our first, yeah, we've had our first couple of, uh, of guests already that have come from that. It's been really cool. So I'm, I'm hoping this, this, you know, I'm, I'm really excited to see how that, that part of this program's growing. Last thing for the interview is where can people find you, right? If they want to reach out to you, either hire you to speak or hire you as a coach or read your books, where can they find you? And second, more importantly, who are the types of people that should reach out? Okay, great. First, uh, gingerjohnson.com, just like the spice in the last name, G-I-N-G-E-R-J-O-H-N-S-O-N. They can, uh, my, my canon is there. My other book is there actually, if they're interested in that. Um, speaking, programming, coaching, and so forth, all of that can be found there. And I'm happy to take phone calls. My number is publicly available because I'm happy to have those live connections. Um, who, is that the next question, Richard? Uh, who should reach out? Who are the types of, the ideal person to reach out and, uh, and, and hire sure. you? Sure. Um, I would be honored to serve, help, be hired by people who see that they want to be very intentional in creating and developing their relationships with the idea that they're going to take care of other people. So some of those groups I mentioned before, educators, uh, network marketing companies, people who quote our sales, but the people with the sales mindset of sales is service, service is sales. Um, people who want to take a look at how to connect with other people with true meaning 
people who want to get out of the ick of networking, who don't like that, who just want to run screaming and don't tell me I have to go to another one of those events, I can absolutely help them and I'm yeah. delighted to do that. I also do, the last thing I would say is um, I help a lot of people with their speaking skills because as a connector, I need to be able to connect with other people and I can teach people how to connect with an audience of any size. And so if they're interested in that a particular arena of connectivity, I would be delighted to help. Awesome. So for those of you who are listening, it's gingerjohnson.com. Correct. Um, and if you're, if you're looking for learning how to do connection, which, um, you know, I've, I've, I know it's a skill that a lot of people are looking for, it definitely takes time to reach out to Ginger. Hopefully you've heard through this conversation, she's an expert in this space. Um, and I can tell just from listening to her that she knows what she's talking about here. So really appreciate you coming on, Ginger. It's been incredibly wonderful talking to you today. Um, also, I wanted to point out that we may or may not be related because my mother's maiden name is Johnson, right? Yeah. So yeah. I have I have, uh, I have a grandpa Johnson and a grandma Johnson and a whole Johnson line of the family. I've got a whole bunch of family that's, uh, that's Johnson. Um, <laughs> Very good. Well, it's so been a anyways. pure pleasure. And uh, I look forward to hopefully seeing you on your travels. Uh, wherever it might be, whether it's this trip or another trip, but reach out anytime yeah. these too. Um, when, we, uh, when we get up to Oregon, I'll reach out to you. <laughs> Please do that. Please do that. Indeed. Well, thank you so much, Richard. It's been a pleasure, truly. Yeah, awesome. Same to you. <laughs>